afternoon from Language Nut this afternoon. Welcome to our MFL SOS for early career teachers, ECTs as we know them in England, probationary teachers in Scotland and Wales, and new and recently qualified teachers. OK, so we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. Um, tonight I'm presenting with Emma Bilbra, who is um, one of our latest additions and uh, staff to join Language Nut. And obviously Zoe, our head of content, is always um, around for our webinars and Zoe is working behind the scenes today, but she may well pop up with some suggestions at any time during the session. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand over to uh, Emma, who is at the opposite end of the spectrum to me. As you know, I've been in teaching those of you that have seen me on webinars before for a long time, worked um, very uh, along a lot actually with uh, newly qualified teachers as they used to be called and set up um, an accreditation process for uh, newly qualified teachers in 2014 for a previous trust that I was working for. So I've had a lot of experience working alongside uh, both trainees and mentors and newly qualified teachers. So I'll pass over to Emma, who I'm sure would be delighted to tell you a little bit about what she has done. Emma, over to hey. you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Emma. Um, I have until very recently been teaching um, Spanish and French in a secondary school down here on the south coast. Um, before that, I uh, taught English in primary schools in Spain, so I've got a, a bit of EAL background as well. Um, more recently, I have been the subject lead for the South Down Skit, so working with um, uh, trainee teachers. Um, and I've also been um, an IT team mentor for the last uh, six years. So uh, I've got some experience in that and very excited to have recently uh, joined the customer service team at Language Nut. Thank you, Emma. OK, so without further ado, we will move on. As always, we have our important instructions that uh, anything that you see on this PowerPoint tonight really is useful to be um, looked at alongside the video and the recording of what we're doing. And we always want to thank everyone in the MFL community because I think they are one of the most um, collaborative subjects that there are around in, in teaching. Um, lots of ideas that are shared both in person and on social web on social media. And any ideas that we have in this webinar are suggestions and not mandatory. And please always be mindful of the policies that are happening and are taking place in your institution. So tonight's session is going to be looking at four areas. Um, surviving the step up from the trainee year, meeting the teacher standards and whatever assessment criteria are used within your own environment or your own nation to assess you as a teacher. Making the most of your induction year or maybe years. If you are uh, in England, you have now uh, got two years of induction rather than one and the next few years. So just a quick recap on what's happened. This is particularly for England uh, and I won't spend too long on this. Um, we knew up until last September, the end of August, uh, the NQT became the ECT, which is the early career teacher. And now uh, the ECT early career teacher um, serves an extended induction of two years. And basically you will get a mentor and you will have time off timetable to do extra things. And you are also being uh, judged along the teacher standards as always. Um, those of you that are in that position in England, there was uh, a, an evaluation done in May 2022, which is in the public domain on the uh, DFE website. And it was uh, done um, using uh, answers from uh, young teachers who were just qualified, from mentors and from induction tutors. And it took in over 19,000 responses. And the positives that came from it is that mostly, especially primary teachers, were positive about the induction program. It took in the views of induction teachers that uh, induction tutors, sorry, that most of them feel it's on a par or better than previous programs. And it also said that 84% of um, new teachers would happily speak with their mentor if they had an issue. The challenges, as we can all guess, what we were finding from the, the new framework was the time commitments and the workload. Both ECTs and uh, their mentors are struggling with this and they are now trying to uh, look at ways in which they can improve the situation for that to be become less of an issue. The next review is due in August of 2022 and will be published in the autumn term. And um, those of you who are joining this webinar tonight who are maybe trainees or maybe looking to go into teaching, there's going to be a, a formal accreditation of the uh, ITT providers from 2024. The IT providers are the um, 
the, the awarding bodies or the, the training institutions that put you through your first year of training. And so that's going to be something to, to keep in mind to see which um, institutions actually get through to be able to be a registered accreditors. OK, so we're going to have a look first of all at, at um, the step up from the trainee year and the way we're going to do it tonight is I'm going to do a little bit of talking and then I pass on to Emma and then we will swap between the two of us, keeping it within blocks so that it's easier for um, for Zoe who's working behind the scene to move the camera. So we all know that um, as a as a new teacher, you have an entitlement to a well structured and supportive induction programme and you must ensure that you're getting that. Um, one or two, I know people who are in this position have said that they find the uh, the new system from this year as being quite restrictive because you are kind of like having to follow a pattern of what's in the um, resources that your school have, have decided to use. Um, and that can be um, quite restrictive. However, it is very well structured and it is very supportive. Um, you obviously are going to work to become uh, towards becoming a self-reflective and evaluative practitioner. And that is not just something that you will do in your first year, second year, third year. It's something that you will do after 30 odd years. Because even now when I work with teachers, as I do frequently in the classroom with our language nut, and when I do CPD, and I know that Emma does this too, and all our team that work in the content team, um, you know, we're constantly learning new things every day. It's really um, vital to make sure that you understand what your development targets are, whether that be from your training year into your first year or from your first year into your second year, or even as you're moving up, if you're going through um, the system and wanting to, you know, to, to do other things in within the teaching profession, make sure you're aware of where, where your development targets are. Key contacts, uh, key contacts, which Emma will mention a little bit later on, are also very important. Um, so, um, who, who's involved in your in your um, trainee year? Who's involved in your first year of teaching um, with you, and who's supporting you? And don't forget um, about the option to join all of the unions because you can do that uh, for free in the first two to three years. Well, I think it's the first one to three years of your teaching now. Uh, making sure that you organise your evidence against the teacher standards or any assessment criteria, uh, making it succinct and not waffly. Um, knowing that, as Emma will point out in a little while, that qu is quality, not quantity. Um, keeping as much as I can abreast of developments in your subject, which is quite tricky to do, but there are lots of things out on Twitter and lots of things on Facebook groups to join. And also uh, the exam boards uh, have loads and loads of training and CPD opportunities that you can um, attend. Of avoiding burnout is extremely important and we all know that at the moment it's very difficult in teaching as it is in every other profession coming out of COVID, but more so in our profession because we have a timetable that we have to adhere to each week. There aren't many professions where you jump to a bell and it's very difficult when you're teaching a five, six period day and you're doing that four days a week maybe with very little free time. So it's it's important to make sure that you keep yourself um, well and we'll talk a little bit about later on in the, in the session. Your mentor is key and will be a different person from your induction tutor and it's really important to to think about where you can have the most visible impact in your trainee year and your first couple of years. I'm going to hand over to Emma now for the next couple of slides, if not three. There you go Emma, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so lots of people, um, trainee teachers have asked me in the past, they say, which year is more difficult? Which year is more challenging? Is it your training year or is it your first year of teaching? And I always answer honestly, and I say they're both extremely challenging, but your first year of teaching is definitely going to be more rewarding. There are so many things to look forward to. So if you're feeling a bit anxious or a bit apprehensive, if you've got a new job starting in September and you're a little bit worried about it, really hold on to those things that uh, you're excited about. So it could be having your own form or your own tutor group, that's something that a lot of uh, people look forward to. Uh, your own classes, or if you're uh, one of our primary colleagues, you might have your own, uh, your own year group, your own class. Having your own classroom, so not only is that a base for you to kind of do your marking in a quiet space, but also that you can make it your own. You can um, put the displays that you want and you can create that environment that's, that's what you want. Even little things like having your name on the door, when the students write your name on their exercise books, it's really exciting. So kind of hold on to those things. Um, and it might be some extracurricular activities that you're looking to get involved in. You're looking forward to a sort of expanding students' cultural knowledge, anything like that. So if you're feeling a bit anxious, just try and hold on to those to those ideas at the moment. 
to kind of prepare for September. I've got a few things that I suggest you collect now or that you ask for now. You don't need to wait until September. You can be asking for them now from your new school. So uh, your timetable, make sure that you've got the correct uh, PPA time. So that's your planning, preparation and assessment time. And if you're in England, you should have an extra 10% of time on your timetable in your first year. And that will go to 5% in your second year. So you have a bit of extra time uh, for you to sort of develop as a, as a practitioner. Ask for the staff handbook now to kind of get yourself prepared. So those also have things like dress code, times day, expectations. It might have a list of staff, so you kind of get to know who's who and who you need to talk to. Ask for your policies on things like uh, marking and feedback, so you know what's expected of you there, if it's marking every two weeks or if it's live marking, how that works. And the behaviour policy as well. It's just going to make that start in September a little bit easier. If you've got all those things and you've read them through and you kind of know, even if you just know what questions you want to ask when you start in September. Schemes of work and your curriculum overview. So ask your head of department or your mentor for that. Uh, you should uh, start to get your class lists before September. Most schools will have them ready. Um, preferably or hopefully rather with uh, photos of the students. If they're New Year 7 students, you won't have that, but that gives you kind of uh, a good starting point in September when you're meeting your new classes. Uh, make sure you have deadlines and key dates, so important things like the end of term and when half term is, um, but also any periods of mock exams, just so you can start to prepare. Um, and connect with other MFL teachers. As Elaine said earlier on, the MFL community is is so generous with their time and their resources and everything they share. So start having a look if you haven't done already on some of those Facebook groups. They're really, really useful. And also the um, MFL Twitterati on Twitter. They're really useful as well. Uh, if we can look at the next one. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so one of the most important things that uh, you're going to need to do in your ECT time or your, your first couple of years of teaching is making sure you're meeting those um, teacher standards and any of the assessment requirements. And a lot of people will be used to this from your uh, your training year. And if we have got any uh, people here that are thinking about going into teaching, this is going to be helpful for you uh, thinking about your training year as well. So we've got some tips that you can do to make sure that you've got the evidence and you're meeting those standards uh, that you need. Uh, the first thing I always suggest is the first day when you uh, get your email inbox. If you've got it already, you can you can uh, create it now, but get a folder in your email inbox where you can put anything that you want to use for evidence and you can just put it all in there and sort through it later. Um, this is something I would always do uh, when I was mentoring, but I would block off an hour on the timetable, um, on the trainees timetable, so you can do it your, yourself as a, as a newly qualified teacher on ECT. Block off that hour on your timetable and dedicate that to going through your evidence. It could be once a week or once a fortnight, but it's going to mean you're really organised. So you know that in that hour, that's when you do your, your evidence. You can collect all that evidence and later on you're going to sift through it because we we talked about earlier on it's quality not quantity it's not just a list of things that you've done but it's showing your impact so not just that you've planned a lesson but what was the impact of uh, on progress for the pupils those things so you can sift through that later but that's what you're looking for um, subject knowledge as well that can be quite tricky in MFL I think more so than other subjects we don't have topics necessarily where we need to um, sort of show our knowledge or our skill it's more going to be on vocab and grammar and we're likely to be teaching at least two languages. One might be stronger than the other. So it's a really good idea to kind of keep a log of how you're feeling at the beginning of your year. So we've got an example here where someone's just sort of said against all those um, grammar points and this was just taken from one of the GCSE uh, specifications they've gone through and said how confident they feel. They can add in if they've taught that particular topic, they can add in any action. So if they've sort of done some CPD, they've talked to a colleague, they've sort of done anything to improve their subject knowledge, they can add that in there and then they can measure that along the term. So you can see how your subject knowledge is progressing and you can prove that uh, you're meeting this um, teaching standard three, showing that you've got really good subject knowledge. When it comes to um, evidence, be really proactive in asking um, for feedback. So you're going to get feedback on your lessons, 
but quite often people pop into your tutor group or people will talk to you on duty and they'll observe you doing something. It could just be an informal learning walk, but you ask for that evidence or you ask for that feedback so you can use it for your evidence. And um, a tip that a colleague shared with me uh, yesterday was that if you know people are very busy, if you write that uh, yourself, you sort of say what you've done in an email and you can get someone to sign that. So you can, you know, saving everyone time there, but you've got a written record of it. Take regular photos of student work. So again, because you're showing the impact, it's a good idea to show sort of before and after. So you can show the impact that particular intervention or lesson or activity has had. Um, things like display boards as well. So you can show that you're creating a, a really positive learning environment um, and do those regularly. So as you see something, you think, OK, that's something I'm going to use. Take a picture then and there. And that's really helpful to avoid last minute panic. Date everything as you collect the evidence. So obviously things like um, lesson plans, you normally put the date on those. Uh, any photos or emails, they've already got a date stamp. But if there's anything else that you're collecting, make sure that you've got the, the date on there as well, because you will need that for your evidence. Your mental meetings can be used for evidence as well. And actually, in my opinion, they're quite underused. They're such a good uh, way of getting in there things that aren't easily evident. So if you've had a difficult conversation with um, a parent, for example, where there's no sort of written evidence of that, you need to be proactive in putting that into your mental meeting notes. And that way you can use that for evidence to show that you're meeting the standard. Um, and last, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So you're, um, you've got uh, a year in uh, two years in uh, in England to show that you've collected all this evidence. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. You don't need to think I haven't got enough by term one. As long as you're collecting things that you need, making sure it's good quality, everything will come over that time. You don't need to worry about getting everything done straight away. Thank you, Anna. Come back to Emma in a second, but um, I just wanted to share with you um, one thing that if you are working with your mentor and you're not sure about what kind of things you might need to um, have as evidence for each of your standards. When I was working for my previous role and I set up the AB for language at Earth for uh, NQTs awarding body, one of the things I did was to break down the eight teacher standards and put together some questions which would be useful for you as a practitioner to say, ask yourself, where, what am I doing with this teacher standard? And also that may inform uh, your meeting with your mentor and as Emma said it's all about showing impact I'm more than happy to send out a full list of these questions if anybody would like them after the session Emma I'm going to hand back to you for the next couple of slides or well, the next one sorry um so some I think about some examples of things we could use for evidence um first things uh, first make sure that you're highlighting the relevant part of a document and annotate it so you you know that you're explaining what the impact is so you know a lesson plan could be a couple of pages long scheme of work or anything that you created like that it's going to be a, a big document make sure you highlight the bit that you're using to support a standard okay so it's really clear to whoever's looking at it okay that's what what that's for i mentioned thing about mental meetings so that's great um just some examples there obviously your lesson plans book sampling that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's come to to look at your books obviously it might be but you can do some book sampling of your own you can take uh three students of sort of different levels of, of ability and you can take them have a look at those books and see how they're getting on and use that in your planning to show uh you know that you've intervened and then you can show the progress so that can be something that you do yourself and actually it's quite good uh, to get into the habit of doing that once a week if you if you can't manage every lesson but that's a that's a really good uh, thing to do um obviously your lesson observations you can use uh, behavior or reward logs however your your school will do it they have a definitely have a policy which you can use alongside any sort of uh, behavior or reward log uh, to show that you followed the school policy because that's what's really important there that you're compliant with what the school uh, has has asked um cpd records so you can use this alongside your planning to show uh, progress um even uh, like today, I think we can send out certificates of attendance that people can use for their um, for their CPD if they want to. Um, and things like safeguarding and child protection training, which obviously are mandatory. That's really useful uh, to show that you um, you're meeting the teacher standard part two, uh, which I think Elaine will mention uh, a little bit later. Um, and uh, emails and pupil voice as well. That's a really good one. So if pupils feedback, if you've done a survey or that kind of thing, that can be really helpful to use as evidence as well. 
And as Emma points out there, she's highlighted there that you can use the same uh, piece of evidence to cover several standards at once. So it's about quality, not quantity. When I've looked after um, new teachers and trainee teachers, it's always been meeting the, the teacher standard part two that's always been the most tricky to to deal with because that's about personal and professional conduct and obviously you need to model the behavior uh, that the school ethos is asking you to do and obviously you need to be mindful of british values dress code as well um, and social media is one of the things that i think um young people now find more tricky because obviously we all have our own private lives and we all have our own social media um, sort of areas that we use, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, whether it be Instagram or anything else to do with that. And it's it's a case of making sure that you are saying the right appropriate things, that you're not saying anything that might be construed to be something negative, no matter how loosely that can be. Um, it, it, it's a, it can be a it can be something that you just need to be very careful with and obviously you're putting your own views out there so meeting the teachers part two standard is is one of the ones that um, has has been often in discussion with me and young young teachers um one thing to be mindful of is that whenever you do an assessment uh whenever you do a, f a meeting or a formal assessment which will come at the end of uh, term three and term six for meeting the teacher standards in the with the new situation in England and whenever that is relevant for your particular situation there should be no surprises in that particular review or that report so everything that you that you see in there you would hopefully be aware of and if there are any surprises then you need to be asking why your progress reviews are always supportive and most of the time they are and if concerns are raised then make sure that these are clearly explained to you and documented and that you are told what you need to do to work on these because otherwise you're not going to be able to make any progress. Just a quick mention here of, of our language note webinars which can help you with teacher standards and you may well want to look at them. They're all free, they're on our website. Uh, again, you'll get this PowerPoint and there's the link to all of them. We have quite a lot on there now from last year and there was one that we did last year for practical tips for an NQT mentors. Um, but in case if you do use language note um, and if you don't use it, our admin area is absolutely great for showing, um, keeping all your students work together. And you can see here just uh, on this left hand slide which shows you a student's overview it'll show you the class overview and you can see how that student is doing across a number of skills and across a number of areas and topics and then on the bottom right side is part of our new product the a-level if you haven't seen which was launched last week for french and spanish and therefore you will be able to see the uh, marking criteria for the a-level uh, for all the exam boards uh, including scotland hires and you can then annotate the marking just by highlighting it and putting your comments in there and again they're all kept in one place OK, so very useful for evidence. OK, Emma, I'm going to move on to the next section, which is making the most of your induction year. And Emma's going to start us off with this area. Over to you, Emma. So, um, yeah, this section is about um, giving you some tips so that you can really make the most of your first uh, year or couple of years. Um, and it's important to remember that this time is about developing your practice. No one expects you to turn up in September as the finished article. I don't think there are any uh, teachers that the finished article. We're always uh, looking on ways to improve, but it's really about you developing and learning as much as possible. Um, so it's important in order to do that, uh, to make sure that you reflect on lessons. Um, and we'll have some examples actually of some um, some ideas on how to really get thinking uh, critically about the lesson um, but not just lessons it can also be on any interactions you've had with students and parents and other staff how how a phone call went for example what what went well was that phone call to a parent what was less successful what do you think i'd do next time and you know it might be helpful to to write some notes on those it might be even helpful um to actually sort of do that out loud with your mentor or with a colleague you know to kind of get those um reflections uh, so they're really useful Make sure that you're clear on what you want to work on outside of the classroom. So if there's a particular area you want to develop, make sure you ask support in any areas you feel less confident in. Um, as an example, I think uh, new teachers uh, this year, you've got a, a really tricky situation in that you are still teaching the legacy specifications. So the students that are in 9, 10, 11 now, um, 
they will be doing sort of the legacy specification, but we've also got a new GCSE coming in as well. So there's going to be some changes and you'll actually be sort of some of you might be teaching um, both of those sort of in tandem, which could be tricky. So if there's something you're not sure about, make sure you ask um, and your mentor can uh, get, get, guide you to the right person or get you the right CPG to help you. So it's about developing your practice. So you should never, ever be worried about asking for help. Um, again, for secondary colleagues, um, you will probably be teaching more than one language and one of them might be uh, sort of a weaker than the other. I know for, for me, my French is a little bit weaker. So I've asked colleagues to support me and, you know, even if it's, can you recommend me a film? Can we have a five minute conversation? Could you proofread this reading text that I've written just to build up confidence? And it's absolutely fine um, for you to do that, because remember, you will have a stronger language and you'll be able to do that for someone else as well. Um, and for uh, primary colleagues as well, um, you know, obviously you're amazing. You, you've got such a subject knowledge across all the subjects, but sometimes, you know, we understand that MFL might be, uh, sorry, might not be your, your specialist area. And it's absolutely fine um, to be asking colleagues, whether it's in your school or even outside your school, um, for help on that. So never be afraid of that. And obviously look out for, for webinars and other CPD opportunities. Um, obviously uh, Language Nut have a fantastic series of webinars um, that Elaine's mentioned. Um, but also things like um, the exam boards, they uh, do a lot of CPD opportunities as well. So keep an eye out for those. Um, thinking about making the most of your NQ, uh, sorry, your ECT year, your first couple of years by um, really planning your time. So it starts off with your timetable. And we already mentioned blocking out an hour a week or fortnight uh, to go through your evidence. I would probably say an hour a fortnight is going to is going to be OK for that. But do the same to prepare for your mental meeting. So the more you can plan and prepare for your mental meeting, really think about uh, you know, where you've made progress this week, where you've uncovered areas that you're less confident in. That's what's most useful about those mental meetings. So make sure you prepare for that. So if you block off an hour a week or sorry, a fortnight for your mental meeting, you know you're going to be really well prepared for that. Um, the other thing, because like we said, um, some of you will have um, a little bit more time on your timetable. So use that time to take the opportunity to observe other colleagues to develop your practice and a couple of tips on on observation. So you take control of it to make it effective as possible. So, you know, there's something that you want to work on. You go with that to your mentor and they can point you in the right direction. Um, don't think it has to be for a whole hour. It doesn't, as I know that's a huge chunk of your time taken away. But, you know, just think if you're looking at routines and relationships, just observing that first 15 minutes might be really helpful. Uh, you might want to look at the end of the lesson to see how they manage transition. So it doesn't have to be for the whole hour. That's fine. Make sure you've got a focus and that can be guided by your targets in the course and your mentor. Um, but it could also be um, something like student tracking. So if you've got a student in your class that you're having a, a tricky time building a relationship with or uh, maybe they've got a particular need that you want to learn more about how to meet, you can observe that same student with different colleagues. And that's a really useful thing to do as well. Um, a variety of practitioners. So make sure there's outside your department. To, it's brilliant to observe your, your colleagues in the department. But definitely try and, and, and see other people outside in, in all the subjects because it's it's so interesting. It's it's actually a really, really good opportunity and you can uh, do that in other schools. So if you're in, a, in a, a trust, you could go to a different school and observe someone with a with a particular focus. Um, and don't only go and observe the most experienced teachers. So some people say, oh, well, the head of science, he's fantastic with behaviour management and I'll go and see him. Actually, what you want to do is observe colleagues that are just one or two, maybe three years ahead of you. So you can see how they've progressed since they were an, an ECT. OK, so don't always go for the most uh, experienced person in the school. Um, and this is some of the, um, the example. These images can just be helpful for getting you to um, to think about how to reflect on your practice. So you're getting the most out of it. Uh, you might have seen some of these on your uh, on your training year. But it's just some prompts to get you to think about the questions and um, for any of those, uh, any of you that are thinking or would like to look at sort of master's level in the future and um, that might be useful as well for you as well to, to kind of have a look at those. Um, 
And the other thing uh, I think is so important is to think about your well-being. So in order to make the most of your induction year and you know your career in teaching, you have to look after yourself. And I, I, I know that sounds sort of like a throwaway thing. People say that a lot, but it is really important. So you need to kind of arm yourself with some tools when you're going in to kind of say, this is how I'm going to look after myself. So my top tips carve out a time for yourself and stick to it every single week. So if you've got a standing coffee date with a friend, an exercise class, even um, a colleague of mine once said, well, I have to watch Bake Off, so I'd, I don't do any work on a Tuesday. That's That was their rule. Whatever it is, you need to plan it and you need to stick to it and be really strict with yourself there and say, no, I deserve this time. I'm going to take it. Um, similar to that, think about how you're going to handle emails. So you will get colleagues and parents and students as well who are emailing you outside of school hours, which is not a problem. But what you need to do is decide how you're going to handle that. So if some people just say, well, I'm not going to put them on my phone, that's OK. Some people like to have them on their phone, but they set out a strict rule, say, well, I don't look at them after 8 p.m., 9 p.m., whatever it is that works for you, you plan that and stick to it. Um, observations and feedback, you're going to get loads of feedback, um, whether it's a formal observation, whether it's a learning walk, book scrutiny, whatever it is. Um, and I think you need to remember to focus on the positives first. Sometimes uh, we have a tendency to be really, really um, negative and focus on those negatives first because we want to do well. We want to do well for the students and we're really critical of ourselves. Um, and whilst the reflection is good, we need to make sure that we're being kind to ourselves. So if it takes that you need to um, display them on a little post-it note above your desk, make sure you do that. There is always, always a positive. So look at that first before any other, you know, any other things to improve. With that, make sure you regularly take time to reflect on how far you've come and the progress that you've made. So it could be in one particular area. You think my subject knowledge was weaker. I've really worked on it and now I feel much more confident. It could even be, you know, uh, the relationship you've got with one particular student or a class and say that was really tricky at the beginning, but actually now we're getting better and, you know, there's, there's definitely progress. So make sure you're reflecting on that often as well. Don't take on too much. So, you know, you might be asked to get involved in lots and lots of extracurricular activities and all sorts of other things. You choose what you want to do, but just be mindful that you're not taking on too much. Ensure your targets are realistic and you can be part of forming those targets. So if you know that you've got a huge um, exam deadline or mock marking deadline that you need to meet, make sure that your target reflects that for that week. Ask for help as well. We've already said don't ever be afraid, but I think it's really important that you know that you can ask for help. And that might be your mentor, could be head of department if that's a different person. Um, it could even be uh, your union. They can just just give you advice. So you make sure you're asking for help. Um, and when you do ask for help, I think it's, you know, it's absolutely fine to sometimes just have a little vent and just say I'm really stressed or whatever, but ask for specific help. So if you're saying, you know, I've got all of these things that I need to do this week. Can you help me prioritise? Or, you know, it's taking me 20 minutes to mark each exam paper. Can you help me? Because I think sometimes more experienced teachers forget how long those things can take for, for a new teacher. And the last one is just resilience. So it's, it's a word that's mentioned a lot. It is important. You do need to show resilience. You know, when you're reflecting on lesson, that's being resilient. When you have a bad lesson period one and you need to go and teach three more lessons that day, you're showing resilience there. But it doesn't mean that you take on everything. It doesn't mean that you don't show emotion and it doesn't mean um, you know that you can't ask for help or support so you know whilst it's a term that's really popular I think at the moment to being resilient um, you know just be mindful of, you, of your limitations as well I think. Okay thank you Emma. While this looks a lot it's not because I'm going to I'm conscious of time. Now as Emma said never be worried about asking for help. We often tend to ruminate about problems you go home you've had a bad class don't take it seriously that's something I've been guilty of doing in my younger years and now think back and I think how daft was that. It's not against you it's just against the system but try not to ruminate over that. 
keeping your if you develop your consistency and your routines quite early on, then you're going to make the most of your induction year to be able to concentrate on the other areas that you may be struggling with or having problems with. But obviously you need to develop the systems that fit within your school. Trying things out is one of the things that you, you will get time to do more than you will later on in the in your in your career because you've got more time at this moment in theory to do that. Try videoing yourself and looking back at yourself or even if you if you feel that's something that will help you then have a go at it. Use lots of praise with the, stu the students because the success breeds a happy child. And if you create an environment where it's OK to make mistakes, then you will find that you will have a much better time in those years when you're trying to sort of form, formulate your practice and make make a stance as to what you have. Behaviour strategies is one of the things that we all worry about, even anybody moving to a new school because you, you're starting again. So it's basically you trying to catch a student in. If you see them doing something well, think, right, I'm not going to catch you out. I'm going to catch you in with that behaviour. Say thank you for doing that. Oh, that was great. Well done for helping uh, your next door neighbour with that, your partner with that. Beginnings and endings of lessons, as we've mentioned, are really important. So set your stall out, get those routines established. Your body language, are you welcoming when you're in, coming into the classroom or do you stand there with your arms folded? Hopefully you've done some work on body language. Um, I've done several workshops with trainee teachers and it is so important to know how to stand, where to stand. Smile with the students when they come into the room and, you know, make relative pos positive comments about them saying, you know, I love your bag today oh I love your glasses or what a lovely pencil case it just makes them feel that they um, belong in, and, and that you care about them find out what motivates your students are they into Disney characters are they into fishing I always get them to write me a little letter in the beginning of the uh, time when I pick up a class whether that be in English or in the target language or even half and half and then I find out what what floats their boat what they're into and then I tend to use that during the year and say right I'll pop up a business character here that I know uh, that student likes or I'll maybe talk a little bit about some of the hobbies or some of the things that they're into and it just makes them feel part of the learning rather than you just delivering the same lesson to all the classes you teach. Team teaching is something that I've done quite a lot of and I've done it out of my subject as well because if you have a child in your subject who you're struggling with but in another subject say maths or science or whatever um, where they're not struggling you might want to go and do a bit of team teaching with that teacher um, and that, that way the child will see that you actually are a teacher of all subjects, not just of one. Co-planning is something which happens in lots of primary schools and does happen in some secondary language uh, schools I know, and magpie other ideas. You're not stealing, you're just taking inspiration from someone else and putting your own spin on it. And outside the classroom, setting your boundaries, both outside of the classroom where um, when you're outside of school and setting your own boundaries. So this is what I, as, as Emma mentioned there with the workload, but also when you're on the gate or in the corridor, speak to the children. I'm conscious of the time. We've got 20 minutes left, so I'm going to zip through these next two friends. What I've done here is I've put some examples of stuff that I've done with students, making the most of that time when you might try things out. So we've done some cross curricular science projects where the kids have done some balancing clowns and butterflies and they've written the foreign language on the back. We've done some T-shirt stuff. So we've 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 done some tie dyeing in textiles and maybe they've written some revision stuff on some T-shirts Um, they've made a little sort of mask and they've put the words behind it and they've done that as part of a drama things so we've done a little bit of cross curricular thing they've done an art project where they've drawn someone and labeled the parts of the body this i took from twitter today actually which i thought was beautiful the kids had actually done some little um, in primary school made some little houses with a template and then they'd written their own discussion their own description of their house this was something i did using a roll of wallpaper and we just got the kids to lie down on the floor and they drove around it and then they just put loads of words and stuff to do with the parts of the body or the feelings and this little one at the bottom is what i've used for students so a little bit difficult with their memory where they get a concept band and they write words on it and the, the kids have done that and enjoyed it and then on the next slide we've made some trees uh, with words we've used uh, pair work where some students have been asking the questions wearing glasses and the answerers have been wearing a hat or a garland around their heads we've done some little pebbles and put their words on them we've done balloons we've done a statue to the best student in the class and they like that and then we've done something with grammar called three musketeers which is um, I won't bother going into it now but if you wanted to know how to play that I can explain to you uh, after this session so I'm I'm going to move on to Emma now because we're going to look at the next few years. OK, so Emma, back over to you. Um, yeah, thank you, Elaine. I will uh, try and zip through this as well. So um, just some tips on um, getting the most um, 
of your time so you can focus on what matters. So a couple of ideas we've got here some make some templates that oh, you can uh, that you can uh, reuse quickly. So rather than drawing out a grid every time you can actually you've got a bank of um, starters and templates and you can just use those. So keep those. Um, and another tip is to not uh, don't put the date on your PowerPoints or anything like that. If you can write it on the whiteboard, that's you don't need to worry about changing anything in the future. You've just got a, a little bit of time back, but it all adds up. Um, some other things. So I've seen uh, lots of new teachers and trainee teachers, and I did it myself, create really elaborate PowerPoints with lots of animations and noises. That takes up a lot of time. Just use uh, your normal whiteboard to go through the answers. Um, have a bank of quick low plan activities. So things like you can do with, with mini whiteboards, dictations, vocab bingo, just have that in your mind. That's going to cut down on over planning because we always have a tendency to worry that we'd uh, run out of things to do um, and we'd be stuck with a year nine class and we wouldn't know what to do. So if you've got those sort of activities go to in the back of your head, you're going to be able to cut down on your on your planning time. Uh, lots of uh, time goes into finding photos or images that you can use either for uh, GCSE photo tasks or for your vocab PowerPoints. Once you found them, put them in a photo bank. Just I have mine on one PowerPoint. So if I need a picture of a family on a beach, I, I know exactly which one uh, to use and where it is. Um, think about the time that you're putting into um, making a resource. So, you know, sometimes people spend lots of time cutting up bits of paper to give to the students. Can it be done simpler? Can the students just number it? Is there a way to, to cut down that work for you? Um, exploiting language text, so not just, you know, writing a text and just asking them, uh, you know, five questions, but really get everything you can out. So there's lots of different activities you can do. Uh, find the cognates, find the synonyms, uh, listen and stop me when I get to you. What's the next word? Those kind of things. Um, similar, don't, um, you know, plan uh, three or four different activities for your students to show differentiation or to show support and challenge. Just think about what support you need to plan for that student to access the same resource. So what are their barriers uh, to learning? How are you going to get around that? Don't spend ages creating new resources. Live marking as much as possible. It's really good for the students because they get instant feedback, but it also means there's more time for you as well later on. And um, use whole class feedback. So if you're marking a set of books, you shouldn't be writing the same comment. I don't think that in, you know, in 30 books, if you get to four or five books, there's an issue. Students haven't understood that or that's a common error. I'll reteach it next time. Activities and worksheets, just kind of keep a, a bank of those that you can use for cover if you're absent. Um, and this one, when you um, create your resources, save and name the files really clearly. So holidays, weather, past tense, and you can use the search um, function later. So it's much better than labeling it, you know, 10C3 lesson one, because you, you won't know what that is. So that's a that's my tip for saving time. Yeah, and a great tip that is as well. Um, OK, so just a few from me, obviously diarize your me time and stick to it and think about is this going to help with progress? And if I don't finish it, is anything going to happen? Probably not. So as long as you, you know yourself, which are the most important things. Creating resources, as Emma said, shouldn't really take much longer to make than to be used in the lesson. And a tip from uh, one colleague um, who I work with is, you know, learn the keyboard accent shortcuts or use the Lexi bar, um, which is a really excellent tool to be able to support you with creating resources. Engage help. So if you've got some tutor time when you know that there's nothing to be delivered, you might use that and students in detention, give them a job to do. Exploit your digital resources, as Emma said, where possible to ease the marking load. And on the right hand side here, you'll see two examples, one from the reading, one from the listening. Once the student has actually uh, done the exercise, it's marked for you and the results are sent to you and kept in an area. And then obviously using marking codes and numbered feedback here, we have an example of five different things that you might use to mark your students' work. You could have this um, laminated on the desks in uh, pots if you're at primary or even at secondary, you could have it on the wall or it could just be on the book in the book so that when the students see what they need to know from the numbers they can check what is that it just aids you gives you a little bit more time um, and the last 
kind of thing that we're going to look at tonight really is the next few years with regards to we've looked at time management because that's one of the big things with the next few years is remaining healthy really and looking at career progression um, we all know that in the 2021 survey or if you didn't know that one in five teachers leave after the two years of their uh, of qualifying which is an alarming thing really and um, I remember a, a head in my first school in 1987 said to me Elaine it's not always forever onwards and forever upwards you know just achieve greater satisfaction in areas of your life that are important to you and that allowed me to work to build mostly not all the time through my career a work-life balance and help me to build career long habits um, this next few years will be the most challenging period in your career as a classroom teacher and especially after what we've all gone through with COVID. But as Emma said, remind yourself every day or every lesson what's going well. And again, in the top right hand corner there, you'll see um, a colleague gave me this idea of, of the nice jar where anything that you do is really nice or anything that happens to you that day is it, you can put it there in a little note. And then at the end of the day or when you're feeling a bit down, just open it up and just remind yourself of things that have gone well. Anything that doesn't go well, and when I talk about this, I talk about a moment in time. I've done, I can't tell you how many thousands, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of stuff I've observed in my time um, in the different sub roles I've had. But I always say to staff, this is just a moment in time. Just move on. It's one little bit of time that has not gone well. So just don't, don't let it bother you. I know it does, but don't resonate on it and don't sort of ruminate on it. Follow something negative with something positive. Um, obviously, if something's happened not very well. So, if, for example, um, you uh, need to make some phone calls home at the end of the day to students who are not behaving very well, who are not working very well, then always follow that up at the end with a, a positive phone call um, to a parent who has had a child who has done well, and particularly at one child who maybe hasn't been doing so well but has suddenly turned a corner. That will make, make you feel a lot better at the end of the day, ending it on a positive. Remember that you're not on your own, and here we have lots of different uh, groups that I've put on here. Some of them are MFL, uh, re you know, MFL um, relevant and some not. Um, but there's always the education support number, which is in the middle, which is a 24 hour helpline, um, which I know um, is vital for staff if, if you are in need of some support. It's difficult trying to control things uh, in a lesson, but don't you can't control what you know, don't try to control what you can't control. If a child walks into your lesson, had a fight in a previous lesson or maybe comes in on a morning, had a particularly bad experience with the parent, you can't control that. You have to try and divert that and put, give that to someone who can support that. And it's OK to get emotional um, and try and if you can and get into the habit eventually of, of treating each negative challenge as a learning opportunity and beneath that you'll see um, the ALL which is the Association for Language Learning which costs £70 a year to be part of and your school may pay for that for you but they do run sessions um, every week, uh, every month sorry, I think it's every month, every other week it is um, for teachers to meet uh, virtually. Okay and the last slide Emma, I will hand over to you. This is the last bit from me. Yeah, so it's um, just thinking about after your first couple of years, what do you want to do with your career? How do you want that to progress? So it's obviously, you know, you don't have to be thinking about it, but it might be as you're talking to people and observing people, you pick up some ideas during your, your first couple of years. So obviously there are pastoral roles um, that you, you might uh, want to get involved in, curriculum roles. Um, you might uh, be interested in becoming a SENCO in the future. So um, uh, the special educational needs coordinator. Um, you might uh, want to do research in a particular um, sort of area of education um, and actually you know obviously there's uh, masters and other qualifications available that you can do. Um, I just want to say really quickly that if, if you just want to be a, a great classroom teacher then then that's fine because that's why we get into teaching because we want to be with the students and if if you just want to make you know your practice as good as it can be and spend every day with the kids that is fine. That's a, a, a brilliant aspiration, I think. Um, and just uh, the last thing to mention, I know there has been some um, bit of confusion or worry I've seen on social media about pay progression for early careers teacher. Um, but you should be progressing on the pay scale. So providing all your you know, assessments and everything is complete, um, you should be progressing on the pay scale after your first year. If it doesn't happen straight away, it might happen later that year, but your pay will be backdated from that September. So the change from a one year to a two year programme does not impact your, your pay progression. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Emma. And I can definitely say that has come from an official document. So that is something that we can say there. And if you know, I, I don't uh, have a problem with you showing that to anybody outside of this training session that that has come from uh, an official document. And um, so um, hopefully you have picked up some ideas from tonight's session. And if you have, it'd be great if you could put them on social media and um, you know, say that you've enjoyed the session or at least make everyone aware that it's available on LanguageNut. If you're not currently a subscriber to LanguageNut or you think you would like to have a free trial and a free demo, then um, Daniel um, is our uh, customer service slash teacher trainer. Daniel is absolutely whizzo with uh, contacting people and getting them set up on our free um, to get a free trial and then follow that up with a demo. Um, and then obviously um, myself and Emma, those are our email addresses there. If you feel you would like to have any more questions answered, I'm sure Zoe's going to have some that will be in the chat in a moment and I'll hand over to Zoe in a second. But thank you very much for your attention tonight and I hope you've managed to find something um, from the session that Emma and I have done. Over to you Zoe, are there any questions? Yes, we do have a couple of questions and while Elaine and Emma are answering them, uh, if you've got any more, please do put them in the chat. If not, we can always contact either of them after the session. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, but the two questions I have so far are both from Harry, um, who is an ECT in their first year, French, Spanish and German. I'm very yeah, um, awed wow. by a trilingual teacher. Well <laughs> done. Um, so Harry's asked, first of all, should an evidence folder be structured by teaching standards? What do you, do you think? Emma, do you want to answer that one? I, I think uh, obviously it, you will need to check your uh, your program. I would say absolutely yes. It is the best way to show that you've met the evidence against those those standards. So keeping it as organised as possible. So right from you know day one, create those folders. It might take you a little bit of time to get used to putting them into the right places. Um, although you, you probably have experience from your from your training year, but. Uh, that is the best way to keep them to keep it organized and also because it shows you the gaps where you're missing so you can easily see which standard and which substandard you uh, need to work towards and where you need to collect a bit more evidence I don't know if if Elaine does anything else yeah I think as well you've got to put yourself in the worst case scenario and hopefully this never happens to anybody on this session at all if you were in a situation where you had to have someone externally to come in and assess you to be able to make sure you meet in the teacher standards because things have not gone as well as they could that person might see your folder and want to look at your folder before um, they see you and that's the only thing they see of you before they've seen you so if they see a disheveled folder that's not done according to the standards because that's the way the standards are set out they're set out as one to eight and I would say that's the best way to do it and also if your institution gets a quality assurance I've done a lot of quality assuring in the way in the guise of the awarding body or even Ofsted could come in and they could technically ask for a folder they probably won't because they don't have time to but that will be the only thing that they see it's a bit like a child doing an exam when the examiner gets the the, the, the exam paper to market that's the only bit they can see of the child so think of you as that position and make sure that um, you're making it easy for the person looking at your file to find the stuff um, and that way if you do it in your teacher standards then you know you're doing it the best way you're giving them the best chance and you're giving you the best chance of them, of them giving you a, a much better outcome Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question from Harry is how often are ECTs assessed? Is it the term new progress review? I think you might have mentioned this, but if you want to just answer that again, if that's OK. Yeah, it's a, I'll pick that one up a minute, Emma. You might have something else, but um, there is an, a formal assessment at the end of um, term three and at the end of term six. Now, if you're working part time, that will obviously be different because you will need to consult your own uh, handbook that you will have got from your awarding body that will tell you because obviously that's at different times if, you, if you're working less in the week. Um, the rest of the assessments are all mainly formative, a bit like um, they're more informal. So um, those are the only two points. So I guess if you're a normal traditional teacher doing a full two years, full time then it would be those uh two years uh three end of year one six end of year two anything that you want to add there emma no that's perfect great thank you um harry also asked a third question um while you were talking so um, aside from additional responsibilities is pay progression automatic every year or does it have to be justified or negotiated Elaine, I think is that one for you, I think. Yeah, OK, so um, obviously you've got your teacher standards that you have to uh, go through there. If you look at the pay progression uh, that you can get from your union, you'll see there what are the actual um, pay levels are um, and the upper pay scale. Um, it's normally um, awarded 
normally straight through with you know you'll meet with your person who's looking after you or your line manager it's normally just automatic until you hit the top of that scale that you're on and then obviously you can't move anymore unless you move on to um, a tlr or you move on to the upper pay scale so um that's that's obviously depends upon your own career progression and what you want out of the out of the out of the role can I just um, can I just add to that as well? I think Elaine mentioned this in in a different context, but when it comes to pay progression, the the kind of general rule of thumb should be again no surprises. So it's it's not just something that sort of happens to you at the end of the year, or or sometimes it's done in the, in the next academic year and backdated. It's it's a sort of ongoing process. So you're working through appraisals, through reviews, observations, and things throughout your career. Um, you know with your line manager or whoever that is so it again there should be sort of a policy of no surprises and you sh you should know where you're where you're heading throughout that year yeah i mean i've worked in schools where the head has said you're not getting a pay rise this year because the results are not that great that's going back a couple of years two or three years but it depends very much upon your own institution that having that conversation if you don't ask the question you won't find the answer so you know having that conversation when you start a school is always important then you know where you stand Great, thank you very much. And um, the last question, more of a practical one for the session. So Dominique has asked if it's OK to get slides from the presentation. Um, so yes, we will send yeah. uh, those out with the link. And I've also put a link in the chat to the previous ones that we've had. Yeah. Um, and we will try to get this recording up as soon as possible. That's it for the questions. If you want to wrap up, Elaine. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Zoe. If you want to email me or Emma at the end of this thing, we can I can send you these slides literally now <laughs> um, and you can have them straight away um, but like I said at the beginning it's always important to read the the, the slides alongside the the actual recording um, because then you, you kind of don't misinterpret things and things like that and and sometimes it, it can it can cause a little bit of friction in your own mind what was said there what was said that but again we're more than happy to answer any questions I'm sure Emma is um, if you, anybody wants anything clarifying that's absolutely fine so thank you very much for tonight's session. Uh, we wish you all a nice evening. I hope it's nice where you are. It's a bit cloudy where I am in Leeds. Um, I'm not sure what it's like down in Brighton and Cambridge where my other two colleagues are, but I'm sure uh, we all wish you have a, have a nice evening. <laughs>